Hello, welcome to the Horticulturalists. I am Matthew Lucas. And I am Stephen Ryan. You are indeed, and we post every week. So if you're keen to know more about our horticultural, well really mine, because you're the expert, <laughs> horticultural adventures, do hit subscribe. We post every week and you'll hear our continuing adventures. And I'm just noticing your elm tree looks a little sick. No, it looks a little variegated. <gasps> And no, have you tricked me into variegation, Stephen Ryan? That's what's happening today. I am going to convert you, perhaps. No, nope. uh, conversion therapy is banned. Yeah, well, so they say, but this is the sort of conversion therapy that I think everybody needs to go through because variegation can, in fact, be very, very useful in the garden. Oh, I am so triggered and doubtful about this, but... As we're here, well look, there's lots of things we're going to yeah. talk about because you do have a lot of variegated things in your garden which I have disparaged <laughs> every time I see them. Yes. But I hadn't realised that this elm tree is actually a variegated variety. I had actually, if you was just thought, yeah. it was infected. Yeah. And I have to say, I have mixed feelings about this particular tree. Yeah. What it's is it? It's, a, it's an, a Chinese elm called Almus parvifolia frosty. And the name is, it sort of says what it is. I like variegations that are quite purposeful. I mm. tend to go for the brighter, more obvious variegations. The vulgar ones? No, the bright, <laughs> cheery ones. <laughs> Frosty sort of one of those things that sneaks through on me because its leaves, when they first come out in the spring, are virtually white. So the whole tree is white like it's covered in blossom. Mm. The variegation then tends to recede through the season mm. until you get a lot of green leaves with white edges, hence the frosty bit, uh, and then it goes yellow before it sheds. So it does things throughout the year which are subtle. They're, it's not a strong variegation, mm. but the tree itself is stunning. It is, a, and it's a mm. very handsome tree. It's near the front entrance to your house, so you I, always yep. see it. I drive under it every day and it changes almost daily. So I forgive this one for not being overtly variegated mm. because it is such a pretty tree. So generally speaking though, if it's gonna be variegated, let's do it properly. Okay, well, if we're gonna do it properly, Steve, you're gonna to have to show me some things that do show us how it's done properly so and I will I'm, look I'm open I am ready for whatever <laughs> vulgar variation you've got to throw my way uh, you've already put half of our audience off but anyhow right. we will manage let's, let's go let's go okay is this an easy introduction because I have to say I've seen this in your garden often the fatsia and yep. I don't dislike it. <laughs> See, I'm winning already. Yes, this is a variegated form of Fatsia japonica, and it's funnily enough known by the name of variegata. <laughs> well, who figures? I'm just noticing too, the variegation goes along. Is this the petiole? Yes. Oh, I've learned that. So the stem, <laughs> it has that variegated yeah. stripe down it. It does. Well. The variegation runs all the way down. Mm. Now, this is a slightly informal and odd variegation because it tends to be more towards the tips of the leaves. Yep. And I find this particular plant very cool, relaxing looking. It's not a, an in-your-face thing, and yet it's got these huge tropical leaves. And so it's a very telling plant in the garden. It's very beautiful. And now, the first thing we should probably talk about then is why variegation occurs naturally because obviously it's, it's then selected but yep. we'll get into fashion in a minute why would this happen in the wild all right well most variegations are actually a virus and the virus actually oh. kills the green pigment in the leaves and so another color will come through usually white or yellow mm. um, and sometimes both mm. so you can actually get variegations that have more than one color in them mm. and what happens is that because the pigment is less in a variegated leaf the plant itself tends to be less vigorous uh, because Which can it can be beneficial with some vigorous things if you don't want them to be vigorous. Well, exactly. The, the plant will stay a little bit more compact. It mm. may be much smaller in growth. It may be slower in growth. So it may mm. still eventually get to the same size, but it'll just take longer to get there. And the big thing with variegation is that it's not always stable either. So this virus can, in fact, go in either direction. So given that it's a virus, how is that trait passed on to its offspring? So your fat series in bloom yep. will produce fibre seed. Yep. Do we know that the seeds of this plant are going to be variegated or would you have to take a cutting from this uh, to ensure it? Most variegated plants do not transmit the virus through its seed. Uh -huh. So there are exceptions, but the vast majority of plants don't produce 
seed that will produce variegated plants. Mm. Although having said that, you can get a new variegate show up from seed, but that's mm. because the virus has got in later. So if you're going to propagate any of these plants, you normally have to do them vegetatively, so they'd have to be done by cuttings, yep. or you can do them by tissue culture. Mm. It sometimes doesn't translate through the roots either. So if in fact you can grow something from root cuttings, Often the plants that you grow from root cuttings won't actually transmit the virus as well. <laughs> but hang so, on, root cuttings, uh, <laughs> I don't think we, we'll have to do a film about root cuttings because I've never heard of such bizarre barbaric yeah. practice. Anyway, yeah. let's carry on. Now, the other thing I notice about this fats here is yeah. that these, this uh -huh. crown yes. of leaves here has no pigmentation. Well, I mean, it has, it's yeah. lost its chlorophyll largely. Yeah. Now, with no chlorophyll, the plant can't photosynthesize. No. What's going to happen to this stem? That stem will feed off the rest of the plant for quite some time. That stem's actually been there now for probably four or five years. Does it always have these very pale leaves? Yes, that stem is always white. Ah, but if I was to try and propagate it from a cutting, it's not self-sustaining because it has no chlorophyll, so it won't survive. So long term, it's a dead end. It's a cannibalistic parasite. <laughs> yeah. It's eating its no. own self. Well, it's very pretty. I mean, at it some is, stage... I will give you that. It yeah. is very attractive. Yeah. So variegation, uh, when it becomes completely variegated, is a dead end. And of course, the plant can go the other way and throw branches that are completely green. Now, therein does raise another issue. So the green branches are far more vigorous than the variegated ones, so they can actually take over. So if the variegation is important to you, if you get a green branch... Prune, prune, prune. Yep, take it out straight away because it can dominate the plant. So it can mm. go back to being, in fact, a green one. Oh, goodness me. All right, well, you know, so far the conversion <laughs> therapy is working because I, I, I've always admired this, even with its albino-ish bit there. Should we go and look at something else that might be more challenging, Stephen? Yes, I think I've got just the thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm up for it. Uh, Mr. Ryan, here we are amongst your bamboo grove. And in fact, we did do a bamboo epic video, which we will link below. What a good idea. This, I also find quite attractive. Uh oh, yes, You're well, there you go. So I am winning. It's interesting because variegated grasses and hostas apparently are actually plants that the tasteful gardener will still allow in their garden. You do have grasses, so maybe that'll be our next pit stop. But yeah. first, my question is, can any sort of plant develop a variegated form? It's very possible. Uh, I'm not sure that there's anything out there that couldn't variegate at some point or another. So, mm. And certainly new ones are showing up all the time, mm. uh, some which should end up in the compost, some of which people should in fact engage with. Yes. One has to be selective when one has a new variety, whether it's variegation or flower colour or whatever. True. There's no point in growing rubbish and there has been some pretty rubbishy variegates out there at times. This leaf though, we'll come and show you closely, is just stunning. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a very organised striated variegation, so it's mm. nice and stripy. And I think that's why some of these variegations are actually seen as tasteful, and whereas the splotty, botchy ones, people see as hectic and vulgar. Yeah, so yeah. these ones sort of make their way through. So this is one of the many variegated bamboos. There are quite a number of them. All right. But their variegation nearly always tends to be in this long, stripy effect. And is this a clumping or a running bamboo? Uh, well, this one is classed actually as a running bamboo. It's a himeno bambusa, but it's been in my garden for years and it hasn't even really started walking. <laughs> so it may be that it's in quite a dry, root infested garden bed, so it's sort of holding it back. There you go. I guess the other thing of interest when it comes to variegates, because mm. they are actually a virus, yes. they can spread. Okay, yeah. So, uh, are we going to catch it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I hope not anyway. But the thing is, if you've got a lot of variegated plants in your garden, then there's actually more chance of something else that started out green throwing a variegated sport. Really? So there you go. And I've got a number of plants in the garden at the moment that are actually doing that. So they're, they've just spontaneously arisen in the garden here. We will see in time whether they're worthy plants to bring into cultivation. So that's the fascinating sort of science question as to how is it transmitted, whether it's through an insect or mycorrhizal fungi or yeah. a biting, chewing thing that it's bites and chews somewhere else. Normally sap suckers. Is it? So things like aphid are particularly prone to spread not just variegation virus, but of course all sorts of viruses that are right. detrimental to plant growth mm. are spread by sap-sucking insects. Sap-suckers? <laughs> yes, there you well, go. Well, now you mentioned the grasses, and I know mm. you have some chloritic 
dead looking grass. <laughs> no, I've, got some, I've got some stunning variegated grasses oh, which oh. we should go and look at. Let's go and have a look. All right, let's go. <laughs> variegated grass. Is this yeah. a grass? Well, it's a reed, uh, so it's slightly different to a true grass. But this is a Rundo Donax variegata, the variegated oboe reed. Mm. And for me, it's got to be one of the most spectacular and useful variegated plants I have in the garden. It's stunning. It is just beautiful. It can grow up to three or four metres tall, or sort of 12, 15 feet in the old measurements. And it has the most strikingly bold variegation, again with the lovely linear variegation that runs down the leaf. And I just treat it as a herbaceous perennial, cut the whole plant to the ground in the winter when it starts looking a bit scruffy, mm. and then it all comes up fresh in the spring. And watching it erupt out of the ground is one of the highlights of the gardening year. There you go. So given that it's herbaceous perennial, pretty hardy then? It's tough as, in fact, the green form of it is a declared noxious weed in Australia. The variegated one being less vigorous is less likely to be a problem. But of course, in my own garden, I manage it. So I don't allow it to set seed. I don't allow it to move around the garden because mm. I want it where it is. So mm. I dig up bits that are extraneous. And I think there's one more grass lurking over there. Yeah, a really weird looking variegated. That looks that we, sick. Yeah, we need to go and have a look at it as well. Because this is quite beautiful. Come on. All right, let's go. Behold, a chlorotic grass. No, another variegated grass. This is one of the miscanthus grasses. Yes. And unlike most grasses, it has decided not to have vertical stripes in it. It has bands across the leaf. Like look at zebra that. zebra stripes. It is actually really unusual and yeah. striking. Well, yeah. they call it zebra grass. Oh, it almost <laughs> looks like batik. It's extraordinary. Yeah, so it's a really weird variegation uh, and very few plants do this sort of variegate. From a distance, it sort of looks like light is filtering in from somewhere. Or that it's sick and diseased. Or that <laughs> Whatever. But I have to say, I quite enjoy it, but it is one of my more subtle variegated plants. Well, I'm getting more and more convinced by variegation, Stephen, but mm. let's see what else you have in store. All right, let's go and have a look at some other things. Well, here we have a variegated tree that I find quite successful in my garden. And this is a variegated form of Melia azadarach. Now, Melia comes from Southeast Asia right down into Northern Australia, so it could be considered as a native. And it's a deciduous tree. Uh, it gets quite attractive little mauve flowers on it, followed by yellow bead-like berries. But for me, it's this quite strong strident variegation. This particular cultivar is called uh, Emerald Snowflake. And it's a nice stable variegation, and that does raise an issue. If it's a big tree and it's not stable, you're going to end up with a green piece 55 feet up in the tree, which you then have to deal with. So I will not plant a big tree that I don't think is a reliable and stable variegate. Otherwise, it looks leprous. So this one's really interesting. You don't see it around very often, but it's definitely worthwhile looking out for. <laughs> now, Matthew, here we have another variegated plant that I want you to engage with. I hate cannas. And I that's don't a... love variegation. What's this, Stephen? This is called a variegated canna. <laughs> this is a canna called Canna Stuttgart. Oh, and Stuttgart. Stuttgart exhibits something that is fairly common in variegated plants that mm. you need to be aware of. Mm. The... But before you go any further, I am just going to contradict myself and say this actually looks very beautiful because. <laughs> It's habit, it doesn't look very canna-like because it sort of looks more like a, a haliconia or something tropical. So yeah. I, well, again, <laughs> you're winning this battle. Anyway, ah, back, ah, back right. to this particular battle. All right, now it is illustrates something that you need to be aware of. Variegations are often more sun sensitive and the variegated part of the leaf will often burn. Now ah. with a canna, we've got the problem that Canna's like a fair bit of sun to grow well, mm. but in the case of Canna Stuttgart, if you put it in too much sun, all of the leaves will burn. And this so one has this... got some serious burn marks on it. So that's what's happened. It's yep. not just the leaf is aging, it's no, actually sunburned. No, it's sunburned. So the trick is to find a place where you can grow the canna successfully so that it gets enough light, but where it's not out in a lot of hot sun where the leaves are going to burn and look scruffy. So it is quite a challenging plant to grow well. In Australia, 
earlier, so probably mm. morning light is best, isn't it? And then I would think so, and and very high light levels um, without too much direct sunlight on it the rest of the day right. would work quite well. I must say, this is a really beautiful plant. What are its flowers like? Are they anything or are they nothing? Well, the f <laughs> compared to most cannas, they're nothing in yes. that most cannas have big, gaudy, flamboyant flowers. Like yeah, but this one has comparatively small, probably in the old measurements, a couple of inches wide, and it's a soft apricot. Oh, okay, but so, the role that it places in the border, though, is beautiful because it's more about the foliage oh, for you, isn't it? Most definitely it's about the leaf, and mm. so I think it's a worthy plant if you can get the right spot to grow it well. It is. Okay, well, I'm still yet to be challenged, but I'm sure there is something I'm going to dislike intensely. Oh, well, let's hope so. <laughs> let's go and have a look at some more. All right, Matthew, we have here a very bold and somewhat in-your-face variegation. This is a plant called a Butylin Thompsoni picta. Picta meaning spotty, and it's an obvious name for a plant like this. This is a sort of plant that most people find as vulgar and offensive. Uh, I think it's a rather interesting variegation, and if you've got it growing in a semi-shaded spot, it actually looks like sunlight is shining through from somewhere when you look at it from a distance. So some of these spotty variegates can be very useful in the shade to lighten it and make it look like sunlight's coming in. This one also has quite attractive orange Chinese lantern type flowers, uh, but that's not the main game. It's this bizarre, mottled, almost hologram type variegated foliage, which I find sort of honestly vulgar and attractive. <laughs> variegated ivy, Stephen. Ivy has thrown more variegations, I think, than almost any known plant. So really? there's masses of different variegated forms of ivy. This one's one called Glacier, mm -hmm. and it's gone into its adult form because it's growing on a stump underneath. It covered the stump, and now there's nowhere else for it to go, so it produces its adult foliage, which is sort of more spearhead shaped and not yep. so ivy like and flowering of course because uh, that's what it does when it goes adult and what i'm noticing is it's a real bee magnet oh, i would never yeah. have thought that ivy a um, would be so floriferous and b that it would be such a pollinator's dream yes the bees love it and apparently in its natural habitat it's a very important pollination plant because it flowers at a time when the bees are looking for something so yes. it's very useful and so its habit in terms of that maturity and then the flowering is like the climbing hydrangea that we featured well done you're yes. exactly right yes our climbing hydrangea yeah. Yes, it, it does exactly the same thing. It has a juvenile form, then it grows to the top of something and, and the it branches starts to come then, out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where it sets its flowers, so that's adult wood. And I have to say, this variegation, I think, is a very pleasant silvery light I variegation. And interestingly, just in terms of, of how to use it too, so you've grown it on a stump. Now, ivory is known for being quite vigorous, but you naturally contain it by making it a, um, a medium-sized upright in the garden that has nowhere else to go. Yeah, and becomes basically a shrub. Yes, and it's beautiful right by the side of the drive. Yes, and I noticed a second ago oh. that it's doing something naughty. <gasps> It is Naughty reverting. Ivy corner. Yes, it's uh, it's reverting to the green. The green will be far more vigorous, as we've said before in this particular segment, and that needs to be removed. Now it's interesting you say that. You can immediately see the difference between the leaf. I mean, yeah. the leaf size. Yeah, the variegated one is much smaller, yeah. much more petite. Uh, the green one is much more vigorous, and therefore it needs to have its head taken off. Oh, all right. Back in there we go. Here we go, all gone. Well, here we go, Matthew. Another plant that I'm hoping you'll love is a variegated flax. Now, all right, well, firstly, I generally, God, and I really don't want to offend people, but I do not like New Zealand flaxes. I always think they're scrappy, they're used in municipal planting badly. Yes. But I'm going to say, this is really elegant. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with a lot of the hybrids and cultivars that are being grown and sold out there is that they have quite stiffly upright leaves and then they crack and bend. Yes, and actually you've got one by the drive which we'll, we'll show footage of which exemplifies that and right. I dislike that intensely, yeah. I hate to say. This one though. Yes, it has nice arching leaves so that it doesn't in fact get that sort of cracked and miserable look about it. It's actually quite an elegant plant. I can't remember the cultivar. I got it years ago. It's just been sitting here minding its own business in the garden and I think paying its way. So maybe with our flaxy friend, and flaxes are used a lot in Australian landscaping and in Britain actually because they're quite mm. hardy, aren't they? Yeah. 
But let's talk about fashion because you mentioned in, earlier on that variegated forms have gone through fashions. And yeah, at the moment, certainly. we're probably at the peak of tulip mania when it comes to indoor, particularly tropical plants that have got variegated oh, forms. Oh, yes. If you've got a good form of Monstera deliciosa with Thousands. variegation, you can charge an enormous amount of money. Stupid isn't it, money. Isn't it madness? So mm. has there been a fashion for variegation before? Oh, yes. Yes, variegation was seen as novel way back. And mm. in fact, <laughs> you mentioned tulip mania. The tulips that had the um, split colours, where mm. you got this sort of flames of colour through the tulips, they were bringing huge amounts of money until they realised that was a virus. And then, and then the bottom fell out of the market. So there you go. But now that we know where the viruses come from and what they are, mm. we can appreciate them for what they are and, and not be sort of uh, dismissive about them. I think some of the variegations um, uh, have become really fashionable again, not just the Monstera, but lots and lots of other tropical plants and lots of garden plants. But at some point we'll need to talk about how to use them. We will. Mm. Well, we'll get to that. Um, another question then is, if you say have a tropical plant that's generally very fashionable and you wanted to force a variegated form of it to emerge. I mean, can science do that? Can you manipulate the gene or can you infect it? What would you do to try and create a variegated I am not plant? sure that anybody's actually successfully uh, inoculated a plant with variegated virus. So if you do want to get a variegated plant in the garden from something, it's more about chance. Mm. So the more plants you have in your garden that are variegated, mm. the more likely you are to get something that's going to cross over. So guess what? No likelihood of variegation in my garden <laughs> because there'll be nothing, Steve. Although I actually did buy a small, a miniature bamboo from you that's yeah. variegated, yeah, a Japanese see, one. Yeah, see, oh. You're nothing if not inconsistent. I know, <laughs> inconsistently inconsistent or consistently inconsistent mm. and you are an enabler. Is that a variegated Sambucus? Yes, we've got that in the garden as well, so there you go. Oh my goodness, because we have made an epic Sambucus video too. What's that one called? That one is called Madonna. Oh, as in? For reasons I have no idea. I don't know whether it's named after uh, the religious Madonna or whether it's named after the, the singer. Sacrilegious. <laughs> the sacrilegious Madonna, I don't know. But yes, it's a cultivar called Madonna, which has gold variegated foliage. All right. Maybe we should go to the nursery now and have a look at some of the things up there and talk about how to use variegation in landscaping. What a good idea, let's Excellent. do that. Oh, Stephen, this is so triggering. <laughs> a table full of chlorotic variegated <laughs> plants. But joking aside, now, when you're thinking about using variegated plants in the garden, what are some of the things you need to think about about their placement? All right. Some tips. Some tips. All right. Because most variegated plants are very much in your face and very obvious, yes. try not to put more than one variegated plant next to another variegated plant. Use them as a plant that makes an incident in amongst other normal green plants. An incident? Yeah, so that fats here, which is called spider's web, yeah. would look lovely in a shady corner somewhere with lots of dark green behind it, and it would just become like a piece of garden sculpture. It'd be standing out on its own, yes. and you don't have your eye darting around trying to see everything you are focused on that plant because of where it sits. Very, very good advice. And that's the same kind of advice we covered when we were talking about golden leaved. Yeah, exactly. Um, Similar sort of thing. And we'll link that video. Yeah. Now, can I just say this plant here? Yes. Now that is perhaps patchy to say the least. Yes. In its variegatedness. It is decidedly so and it does lots of things it's actually now considered to be a fatinia yeah. fatinia davidiana and its uh, cultivar name is palette yeah. and it looks like somebody has had a bit of a messy palette and it does all sorts of stuff it gets white flowers it gets red berries its old leaves go red before they die yeah. and it gets this bizarre blotchy white variegation in the foliage. Mm. Now, I'm not sure how many people are going to fall in love with this plant. I haven't, just saying. Yeah, well, and, and I went to some trouble to get it and I'm not altogether sure I should have put the effort in. Oops. But saying that, uh, it will sell. There will be people who like that sort of look. So it's sort of interesting, but it might have been one of those plants that should have ended up in the compost. <laughs> All right, what else do we have in front of us? All right, well, we have to engage with the Orcuba. Or Cuba. Or Cuba japonica variegata, the Japanese stardust laurel, uh, well known to all and sundry, was used in great quantities to hide public lavatories in England, <laughs> so it has something of a bad reputation. But again, a great plant for 
dark shady corners to bring that sense of light, filtered light coming in through from above. Yeah. Makes a great pot plant, would be good on a shady veranda to bring some light and colour in. Mm. And I think it's got an honest vulgarity about it that it you know, needs a place in the garden. I actually do, I really like them. Now I was just holding up the ivy before. This is actually quite beautiful. Too. Yeah, well that one's one called Gold Ingot, yeah. and I grow that as a pot plant mainly. Uh, it makes a great hanging basket subject. Uh, and again, because it's an ivy, they're very shade tolerant. And so in a dark shady corner, they bring a bit of light and color in. And certainly if you've got a really big one hanging down sort of three or four feet or a meter or more below a basket, it can make quite a telling effect in the garden. Yes, and does the variegation of this ivy make it less vigorous? So if you did plant it, it's not gonna go as crazy perhaps? Still grows fairly vigorously, but you're right. Like most variegated plants, it tends not to be as vigorous as its green counterpart. Yes. And I have to say, a plant that we do need to engage with is one of those plants that every tasteful gardener will plant whether they like variegation or not and that is the variegated form of hosta yes and i do i do have variegated hostas i yeah. have to say i dislike hellebores but i love hostas yes well variegated hostas are forgiven by most even those that have very tasteful gardens and again they're great in the shade they make a wonderful mound of foliage their flowers are attractive and they're a very good way of knowing whether you've got slugs and snails so you know a lot of these variegated plants aren't just one week wonders i mean their foliage is there for months even if they're a deciduous shrub yeah. and many of them have flowers or fruit or fragrance all sorts of other things to go uh to keep you going i guess now this Stephen is well that's a baby plant of one of the most popular of variegated small trees yep. uh, Cornus controversa variegata uh, the Only tabletop dogwood is it controversial no it's not controversial but it has the most fabulous flattened tabulated branches with huge gaps between it so you get this wedding cake effect on the tree and because it has a very dramatic form mm. and also has the variegated foliage it's like a piece of garden sculpture and I will guarantee that the most tasteful gardens in England will probably have their specimen of the tabletop dogwood so there you go very okay. interesting plant it is it is it actually looks quite beautiful oh Stephen variegation and so here we have a table full of leprous chlorotic, chlorotic. <laughs> weird plants well Stephen Ryan I must say our journey <laughs> through variegation has been interesting and there are some things that I've actually really come to love there are still some things I load with a passion but I think what I'm understanding is it's all about context. Of course it is. It's how you use them and where you plant them. Uh, there's probably no such thing as a, an ugly plant in a sense. Well, well, except for that. But it's how you use them in the garden. And yes. there's many a good plant that has been ruined by either over usage or poor usage. So True. you need to consider that. Okay. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this, Matthew. I can see by the look on your face that you're perhaps not completely convinced yet, but maybe I've turned your head a little bit and you are reassessing variegated plants, as I hope other people will. I certainly know there's plenty out there that are paying vast amounts of money for some variegated plants. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, if you want to know what we might be doing next week, which is triggering <laughs> you'll have to hit subscribe we post every week on a friday so do follow our continuing horticultural adventures i'm looking forward to something next week that i might really enjoy Stephen. although i haven't not enjoyed this yeah well we will see we might do something a little gentler for you okay until next week we'll see you soon bye all